Welcome back to the Action for Happiness podcast series. And as always, I'm your host, Guy. Action for Happiness is a movement of people committed to building a happier and more caring society. And our guests truly embody this in so many wonderful ways. In the studio today, we have BBC Radio 1 and Radio 4 sports presenter, Simon Mundy. Having been at the BBC for over nine years, he started his own podcast entitled Don't Tell Me the Score. And he's had some incredible guests such as Dame Kelly Holmes, the amazing Daniel Goleman, and very recently, the Headspace founder, Andy Puddicombe. What I love about the show is that the sport element is secondary to the life lessons and discussions on the big questions about life and happiness. Joining me on the co-host is my good friend Marv, who introduced me to Simon as they both bonded over their passion for mindfulness at work. We cover this in the podcast and we also talk about the mental aspect and the importance of mind state. We dig into Simon's personal journey and how mindfulness has impacted him. This was truly one of the most fun podcasts I've recorded. But when you play sport, and for me it was tennis, you know, the rules are set up so that you will experience that anxiety at some point, you know, like at a crucial moment or something yeah. like that. That anxiety is is brought to the fore. Yeah. So resilience is bounce back ability, you mm. know, is rolling with the punches when the tricky things hit you in sport and in life. A growth mindset is looking at it and go, okay, I don't know how to work it now, but in X time, I'll be a master at it. Yeah. And that's knowing that fixed mindset is looking at it going, oh, it's so overwhelming, I don't want to go near it. Mm. And there is a bit of a misconception about meditation that, or mindfulness or whatever, that you know, it's about clearing your mind and entering into this Zen space. Like, it's not the point of it. Mm. But like you said, it's what sport teaches us about life. It could, the sport is almost incidental more episodes like this and to access our growing library of podcasts visit actionforhappiness.org forward slash podcasts and also download our podcast app on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts don't forget to like follow and subscribe to ensure you get the latest updates and notifications on new content you know you you were kind enough to invite me on a podcast thanks to the introduction of marv but having been seven years deep in podcasting now to go into the bbc studios you know to pass through security and then to go to experience, you know, the, you know, a BBC mic with a BBC mixer in the in the studio was really a, a wonderful experience. So oh, thank you for that. Pleasure. Yeah, it was great to have you, mate. What got you into the path of journalism and presenting, and then how did that lend that lead towards the the, the BBC? So at school, I was always very gobby, um, and we did one of those psychometric t- tests where they sort of get you to do various exercises and it shows up what you know what they recommend a career for you yeah and th- it recommended for me journalism uh and Spot then on. yeah they know <laughs> hats off to them you should have didn't say you've got a face for radio <laughs> yeah. if i had a pound well i had that for later, had that for later on mate. You on my gym. <laughs> so um and then as well i was a, i'm a massive tennis fan so i'd every day Growing up, I'd re- read this one particular guy, I'd read the tennis report. So a combination of that test when wanting to do journalism and then just I had my sights set on Wimbledon and specifically. I, I would, had a dream that I wanted a broadcast from Wimbledon. Yeah. So that was uh, the goal. And then when I was at university, um, I actually was doing sociology first out. I went to, I just wanted to go to Leeds. And then um, sociology, which is a nothing degree. And after the first term, went back, didn't know we had exams, Dad hadn't done essays. Mm-hmm. It was just in a bad way. Yeah. Right? And a mate of mine had dropped out the previous year yeah. and, and reset his first year. And I thought that sounds like a plan. Mm. So I was actually, and you're like this because you were, you spent time in in France, and I, French was my favourite subject at school. So I was looking through the prospectus. Very f- rare to hear someone say that. Yeah, but yeah, C'était exactly. mon sujet favori. It wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> and I was looking for French and literally opened the book and it opened up broadcast journalism. Mm-hmm. I thought that sounds fun. Totted mm-hmm. off to see the tutor, um, a woman called Judith, and she liked me and was like, yeah, you can do this next year. And I, mm-hmm. the good thing was I never would have got on it had I applied First time, so like most things, right time, right place. Yeah. Cards falling in, you know, yeah. it falling in my favour. Got on broadcast journalism, took that seriously, really enjoyed it. Uh, thought that I would 
this is the long version of the story, by the way, thought that I would, uh, you know, then trip into some of the best job ever. Um, it did a couple of years of like a bit of TV. I used to do crowd warm up for Robot Wars. Remember that? Oh, oh I used to love yeah. Robot Wars. yeah, that was a classic. And then, um, yeah, did some broadcasting, went traveling, completely lost my mojo, uh, came back, was working for a tennis magazine for a few years. And then was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm wasting time. And someone said, you should get back in the radio. And I rang a small radio station and they were like, yeah, we've got a free position, but it's, uh, but it's free. We're not paying you. Did that for a year on a Saturday uh, alongside my normal job. And then uh, took a huge pay cut and went and started in a really small radio station. But like, I, my sense was I was really happy when I did that move, even though I was earning significant less amount of less amount of money. Yeah. I, it's that sense of, right, no, I'm, I'm back on the right path. Yeah. And, uh, and then from there, yeah, just... Went bigger radio station, bigger radio station, and then uh, the biggest. When he, and then got the job at Radio One. You know, thinking, oh, this is the biggest thing I'll ever do. But as ever, the, your sights shift, and then, so I've been there for a while. And, that, and but then to are. meet, um, you know, Boris Becker, and yeah. not even meet in a meet and greet, but to you yeah, know yeah. have a conversation with and to record yeah, yeah. and Tim Henman and yeah, all the guys. <laughs> so how's how how was that for you? Well, so Boris was my hero growing up. Yeah. I mean, hero, right? Mm. So I would be more upset if Boris Becker lost at Wimbledon yeah. than I would if England lost in the World Cup. Okay, yeah. Right. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know. Ridiculous. Awful, well. right? <laughs> <laughs> so I love Boris. And then I met Boris, and, and you know, they say never meet your heroes. Um, but, he, you know, he's an interesting character. He's, yeah. a, he's a funny guy. So, you know, spending time... I, I did some really long interviews with Boris a few times, and he was... I, he'd get sick of me and by the end he's like oh, he's that guy who knows more about my career than I do <laughs> like, you know I'd weird him out yeah. with uh, <laughs> stats and stuff but no it's really yeah it's really cool you know I think you uh, particularly at Wimbledon I've had lots of pinch me moments where I'm like this is amazing in fact I can still remember the first time I worked for Radio Wimbledon so I did that for three years before BBC the first morning I was up I was doing the breakfast show so I was up early and I was sat on Hemman Hill before they'd opened the gates and this was back when I still smoked occasional cigarettes. So I was sat up there having a cigarette and I was looking out like, this is the coolest thing. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, strawberries and champagne. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was too early for that. Okay. In fact, just a fag and a coffee <laughs> at that point. But yeah, so no, it's, yeah, it's cool. Like, and then now like doing the podcast with people who's, uh, who I just really admire and you know, talking about subjects deep, more, more deeply than just in a kind of super shallow sport way, which is often yeah. the way with sport. Yeah. You know, just results, nothing chat. Yeah. To actually go deep with really interesting people is, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so what have been the, the the common themes? You know, you've done, you know, how, how many episodes now? 25 episodes deep? 25, yeah. yeah, I gave it a count. Are there patterns and reoccurring themes that you hear over and over again? Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, I think... A lot, well, so it's it's all about, like you said, it's what sport teaches us about life. It could the sport is almost incidental, you know. It's like it's just a. I just think sport is quite a nice. Things are amped up. Like if you I, an, an example I always give if you, if you get anxiety, say, mm -hmm. and we all experience anxiety at different points of life. Mm. You might experience it in a social setting. You might experience it before job interview, whatever, various things. Yeah. But when you play sport, and for me it was tennis, you know, the rules are set up so that you will experience that anxiety at some point, you know, like at a crucial moment or something yeah. like that. That anxiety is is brought to the fore. Yeah. And it feels, you know, at that moment you're like, oh, yeah. you can only think about the fear, anxiety. Fear of winning, fear of not losing that point. Exactly. And it's yeah. really overwhelming at that yeah. moment. Yeah. Obviously you stop playing 20 minutes later and you realise like, no one gives a monkeys. Yeah. yeah. But so that feeling is the same, mm. whether that feeling you experience, the sensations, the feeling of it is the same at that point playing tennis as it is, you know, if you've got social anxiety or yeah. or mm. whatever. So it's just a nice sort of playground where, you know, those things that you experience in the rest of life, you you, you experience them, but heightened. Yeah. And um, the things that keep coming up, well, so I do like psychology and um, um, various uh, things about human nature, tribalism, stuff like that resilience all, all through to nutrition as well and i mean crikey I'm, anything you can think of as long as yeah. i can fit it into that yeah. thing but the thing that a few things that keep coming up um for example uh, the way the brain works like you know we've got that two parts of our brain the, the human part which is just here behind behind the forehead and then the the old chimp instinctual part deep down which is mm -hmm. the bit that gets yeah. all anxious and yeah. stuff 
so you know managing those two parts of your brain come up in different in different sort of subtle guises but that same theme keeps coming up uh, aspects of resilience growth mindset so, so explain resilience what do you mean by resilience so resilience is bounce back ability mm. you know is rolling with the punches when the tricky things hit you in sport and in life and not getting defeated by them. So another, let me use another tennis example, right? This, and, and I'll explain growth mindset mm -hmm. and fixed mindset. So, right, you're playing a tennis match against someone who is a bit better than you. So you're immediately a bit uh, intimidated, let's say. They hit serve and your first shot is a duff backhand into the bottom of the net. And, yeah. you're like, and then your brain might go, oh my God, mm -hmm. what is wrong with that? What is wrong with me? Yeah. You know, you, it becomes about you. Mm -hmm. Now that is an explanatory style. So that is ha how you how you explain what's happened. So if you make it about you, then that's obviously a bad uh, explanatory style. But a better explanatory style would be okay. Uh, that, that bad shot is in the in the bottom of the net, but you know I'm not going to let that define me. I'm not going to carry that forward. Yeah. I'm going to like leave that there. I know that many times in the past I've hit that shot better. Okay, but park it right. Yeah. So it's like parking it rather than. And carrying it forward and letting it just make you crumble mm -hmm. that, that's one example uh, the growth mindset is let's say we've got lots of uh, lots of technology here in this in this in this room um when you get it like this box in front of me here I, look at it it's just a load of flashing lights and knobs and you think oh, i would never know how to how mm -hmm. to, to work this but a growth mindset is looking at it and go okay i don't know how to work it now but in x time i'll be a master at it yeah. and that's knowing that Fixed mindset is looking at it going, oh, it's so overwhelming, I don't want to go near it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you see that, that comes up a hell of a lot. Yeah, and, and I think that is such a, that's a real uh, important, you know, way to look at, look at life. It's definitely sort of helped me. I know there are times when I'm like, oh, this, I don't know how to do this. Oh, no, hang on a sec. I'm getting stuck in yeah. the growth mindset. And is, is, is that the feedback that you're getting from, the, uh, you know, these guys who have achieved amazing things? Is that the feedback that you're getting back from them in regards to their mind, how their mindset? Well, I think has been at well because because a lot it's not just sports people. So I speak to you know authors and people who have studied yeah, the yeah, sports people. Yeah. When, so when when I say it like that, I'm talking about. <coughs> but yeah, but the, I'm, you, I, I'm rounding off like you're interviewing champions, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it be in sport, whether it yeah. be in like you know an yeah, author yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. And because uh, the message I want to try and get across here is that if that is the information that you're getting from champions. Mm -hmm. It's all about how you manage those thoughts, then, isn't it? Absolutely, and also if you know if the champ if it works for those champions, yeah. then anyone can you know apply the same mind those same things. And it's just about knowing about things like this growth yeah. mindset or fixed mindset. I think yeah. knowing it's half the battle. Yeah, and if you can model a champion like you say yeah. who does it in like as a matter of habit. Yeah, and often these guys, particularly the sports people rather than the authors, or whatever the sports people, are trained you know, in this, in this stuff. So it's just, it becomes second nature to them. So, you know, why not put into practice those skills? And there are skills, so things you can learn and yeah. improve it in their lives. Why not put it in practice in, you know, you, in your every day to day life? Yeah. You know, it's, it's very easily done and, and pretty powerful. So how many of your guests um, speak about the importance of the mind and the, the psychology behind well, it's it? it's everything. And, and, you know, the, how important is it in one's performance? You know, you got the, the mm. physical preparation, which we know, and it's quite visible. But, but you know, how many what how many of your guests really speak to the the mental aspect of it? Like most of them, <coughs> the ones who don't are the ones talking about nutrition mainly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the mind mindset's absolutely key. Two people popped in my head when you were just saying that. Yeah. One, I'm actually interviewing <laughs> a woman next week who won an ultra marathon. Right, it's yeah. like 268. I think I read about Jasmine that Paris. Oh right? wow! Two hundred. She was on Rogan, wasn't she? Possibly. And, and she set the record for it as well. So she smashed the record it's by ten hours. Yeah, she, right. She had to tend to her baby. At and well, she, so so she was breastfeeding at that point, yeah, right? Yeah, and her this. child had been a bit ill, so she had to stop, but eat the checkpoints and express milk. Yeah. And even doing this, she still beat the record by ten hours. Yeah. yeah. Now I've been researching this this woman, and she she didn't. She was not like in the sports science world. She didn't prepare for it in that really methodical, precise way that a yeah. lot of sports people do. Yeah. She was just kind of, you know, getting on with it. You know, obviously there was a, there was a strategy, but yeah. like just not in that really uh, micromanaged way that so many people do. 
And for her to beat it by 10 hours, it's all, it's all about mentality. Yeah. It's all about mentality. How much pain the can you endure as well? The guy, right? the guy who, who previous winner, right? Um, so it, it was her first time she'd done the race. The previous winner she beat, she, who was coming in second, had to drop out with four miles left of the race yeah. with exhaustion because he was so knackered trying yeah. to chase her down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I, it's so weird you brought it up because I read this randomly somewhere. Mm. I was reading from a magazine or something. And it hit me and I read it. And what stood out was the whole mindset thing as well. Mm -hmm. And what it was is when you take in, I, I mean, I grew up with a single mom, my sister, my sister's got four kids. Um, I've been, I've grew up around a lot of women who have, who, who are raising kids and their mindset is totally different in regards to their work rate. Uh, you know, what they believe they can do. They know they have to do this. They have to do that because this is the situation they're in. But I think we're, a lot of the men in the race are going to be slightly more tactical about it and probably more when they face that, oh, I've got blisters on my feet, I've got this uh, sort of problem, more likely to quit. And like you said, he's chasing that woman. Was his mind, I'm the, uh, I'm the old winner. I can't let this woman beat me. I mean, I don't know what sort well, of feedback they're getting yeah. during the race. But is that part of the, the mentality where she's just like, well, I'm going to run this race. Uh, I'm going to complete it. Uh, I've got my kid to look after. I think you're right. And it's, it's, that, mo it's that, that die hard mother mindset that spot. says no matter yeah. what you throw at me, yeah. I have a child, so I can't quit. Yeah. It's, I was reading some of the theories as to why women can do particularly well in these ultra long events because yeah. she's not the only one there are other yeah, examples yeah. Of, of women who who are better than the guys and th they talk about a lot of the things that you sort of mentioned there and, and yeah. that motherhood thing but one thing that struck me that, that i found interesting was about the role of ego in it yeah and they propose that men often will go off really early yeah, go off yeah, fast yeah yeah, yeah. Because because there's that kind of grandstanding thing that men are used to, like looking for ego aggrandizement, yeah. exactly. Whereas women, it's it's just that kind. It's like that, you know, the the uh, the snail and the hare or whatever, the tortoise yeah, and the hare, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two thousand nineteen, two thousand nineteen version. Yeah. Come on, get with the it. Snail Keith. and the hare. <laughs> yeah. Get with it. That's Keith. a mighty long nap for the hare, right? They both got <laughs> shells. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, and whereas women. Again, it's just a, a, a sort of um, an idea, but whether it's true or not, but yeah. they they will just they don't need that, so they they can be that more have that consistent mm -hmm. edge, and then like you say, being a mother and stuff. Yeah. So she was she was she's a fascinating one. I mean, it, it, to do that, it's yeah. all upstairs. Yeah. yeah, and then there's another guy who also popped in my head is a footballer who I spoke to, who was massively huge potential. A guy called Drew Broughton, and was tipped for big things when he was like 16, 17. Yeah. Ended up doing 22 careers, 17 years, like never got anywhere near his potential, retired, yeah. ended up with sex addiction, like nearly homeless, yeah. ended up doing 12 steps. And now he teaches young players to avoid what he went through. Mm -hmm. But but this, his story counters the sort of what most people think, which is that he, he didn't, he didn't not succeed by it because he didn't try hard enough. He tried too hard. Yeah. So he was trying to control too much. Yeah. And he didn't allow for that kind of like, okay, let go as well. Be present and let go. Yeah. You know, surrender, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is yeah. a really important part of mentality yeah. um, and, and stuff. So, you know, you've got two, two different, you've got one guy who's overdoing it and another one who's like totally chill and like, come what may. Yeah. She wins, he doesn't. Yeah. You're listening to the Action for Happiness podcast. My name's Guy and co-hosting is my good friend Marv. We're joined today by BBC radio presenter and podcast host, Simon Mundy. And in this second half, we talk specifically about mindfulness and what matters most. Well, what, the one thing that we do have in common is mindfulness. Yeah. So I, I'd been um, instructing Marvin on, a, on an eight-week course, and he mentioned, you know, in a through conversation with you, that you were also at the BBC doing part, taking part in a, yeah, in, in a mindfulness. Yeah, it was funny because me and Sai are just, you know, catching up yeah. in the gym. You were speaking about John Cabazin or something. Well, it was a bit random, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. He, he, he mentioned the name and I was like, because I'm, I'm terrible when it comes to like books. I just like, <laughs> if I like a book, I, if I get recommended a book, I hardly ever remember the title and I hardly ever remember the author. I just soak in what that book is about yeah. and, I, and I will just absorb that. And that's, for me, that's the main thing about the book. And then uh, Simon mentioned 
the name John Cabot Singh. And I was like, why do I know that Rings name? Rings a bell, yeah? Yeah, and I literally just went like that. One sec, Si, reached into the uh, to the cupboard, went into my bag, and he was like, oh my God, where'd yeah. you get that from? The guy had the book in like two, de- in like less than two days. He wasn't playing around. I think I finished it before. <laughs> yeah, 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 you might <laughs> have done as well, yeah. No, no, yeah. yeah. But yeah, absolutely. We we did. It was it was interesting because he was it was literally at that same moment, wasn't it? There yeah. was these two courses going up. You were doing. I was trying to put with one Marv's, on. and then um, there was this other one, the John Kabat-Zinn's one. And you know, I've always been like the MBSR. Yeah, yeah. And it, so yeah, the the eight week mindfulness based stress reduction. Yep. The mo- I think it's the most studied mindfulness course in the world ever. Yeah. Like it's had the most research put into. When you hear about the NHS or primary schools and secondary school. It's his curriculum and his content that is mm. the basis for all of that, right? Mm. That's where when we talk about the science behind mindfulness, it's really you know that's what pioneered and really mm. got his um, his courses to you know to, to to meet where the the science was going as well at the yeah, same time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So so that you can get the government on board and you can get yeah. you know you don't want this to be a religious context or this hippie. Yeah. Thing. it's like no, this is what the science yeah. is showing now. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it must have been like a hard. <coughs> hard concept to get on there because I think a lot of people like even for me when I was trying to get names and get people get people together on it you know, I was pa- very passionate about it uh, and still am very passionate about it because doing the mindfulness course with Guy basically showed me that a lot of the stuff that I was already doing he was putting names to it and saying oh yeah this is this method that is that method I was like okay I thought I just invented this method because I felt a need to do that particular thing to get me out of that particular situation to be focused on it so I didn't feel what people call down or depressed. That was one thing that I was very aware of affects a lot of people in a big way. Mm. And I never want I never want to be in that way, even though I know at some point I will be, mm. but then it's about being mindful about how long you're in that position for. So that was a, a big part of my motivation because I'm you know, you see it around you left, right and center. And a lot of people can't talk about it. And I'm someone I can talk about my feelings. I don't have a problem talking about my feelings. But what I notice is not everybody else is gifted in that way. And you know, to meet someone like Guy, you know, to to meet Sai, and we just end up on these random conversations. And you know, they go quite deep. But for us, it seems like a normal conversation as opposed to a deep conversation. It's but a real conversation, and the most interesting for me. For you sure, know, you know I, I mean? remember the first time I met you. We went. We went. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, if someone had if someone had heard us that that time, we were sitting yeah. again. So, so, so let's just get it straight. So I'm you and you're me. Right? <laughs> yeah. I think that was literally what I we think said. We were half an hour in. Yeah. Like, yeah, behind yeah. the, it's the same out of you and mine. And those, like, yeah, I agree. That those are the real. Those are the most interesting conversations, mm-hmm. for sure. But yeah, this this John Cabot's in course was advertised at the BBC, and I met, I just saw it on a and it was a woman who's training in it, mm-hmm. so it was free. But I saw it and I and I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'll get, I rang her up and I was like. Um, you know, can I have some details? She's like, yeah, okay, but there's homework. You have to do like an hour of meditation a day. And at that time I was thinking, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. So I remember being like, okay, thanks. You know, thinking I probably wouldn't, you know, take her up on it. And then yeah. I think there's something happened. I've got a funny feeling it was like a, I had a Barney with my girlfriend or yeah. something like that that made me think, right, yeah. do this. And I did. And it was free and, you know, and, I, and yeah. I've st- From week one, you, you you got into it? Oh, I hammered it, yeah. hammered it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and I've stuck with it ever since. Like, I, I get up at half six and I'll do half an hour ideally meditation every morning. Uh, to, every, to, to a guided app or to a timer or um, to a music? Timer or? normally. I've yeah. also still got the, the um, guided meditations that we got from the course, so body scan mm. and stuff. But I, I tend to just follow my breath now. Um, but yeah, I that's try... A, that's, the, that's, yeah, that's it at his... My, I, l- I love stripping away all the mantras and all yeah. the counting the breaths. I'll just, you know. That, just, uh, just keep yeah. bringing it back, keep mm-hmm. bringing it back, keep bringing it Cause back. Because that's such a hard thing to do in itself. I that mean, it's, it's like, you know. Possible. I mean, I'm still rubbish at it, you know. But that's not really, the, that's not the point, is it, you know. Well, exactly. But let's say for that 30 minutes that you're doing, it's that repeated exercise of, all right, noticing the distraction. Yeah. Bringing your concentration back to the breath. And then noticing. So, you're like, you're doing push-ups of always... Mm-hmm bringing it back, bringing it back. So that later on during the day when you have that meeting or that presentation or that podcast or that argument with your girlfriend, it's like in those moments, it's like, okay, let I see this negative thought firing out. Now mm. I can observe it rather than just being so wrapped up in it. Yeah, yeah. And that space that, that you get from it gives you gives you so much room for, you know, just like, oh, yeah. Okay, nah. 
Well, I noticed you've got um, <coughs> altered traits, altered states down there, Daniel Goleman. Yeah. But and I'm main so man, yeah. Lovely guy, isn't he? Uh, and I think he sort of explains it really well. And I think there is a bit of a misconception about meditation that, or mindfulness or whatever that, you know, it's about clearing your mind and entering into this Zen space. Well, I've never really, occasionally I've touched I've a little never, bit. I've never, you know, but like, but, but so negligibly that yeah. it's like, it's not the point of it. Mm -hmm. And, particularly with like mantra meditation you know like um uh tm and stuff they they sort of sell themselves on slipping into like heavenly yeah. realms and all this yeah. stuff but um it's not about that like you say it's about bringing bringing your self back to the breath and just noticing bring it back and he, he explains it very mm -hmm. well so so the altered states would be the the heavenly place mm -hmm. and the altered traits are what you take from the meditation into the rest of your life. Yep. So like you say, when you have the argument, when you have the difficult conversation, you've got work, this tool now that you can draw from, which you, before you don't you have to run yeah. with your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. You'd, you'd have to be a prisoner controlled. Yeah. And you can make that choice. Do I want to like suffer or not? And then if you go along with it, well, that's on you yeah. because there is an option to moment by moment be in the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's you know, I, think it's, it, I think it's perfect. Like both what you guys are saying in regards to that, you can actually recognize where that's going to lead to. Mm -hmm. You can actually see what's down down the road ahead so you can choose to partake and witness that here and you're thinking do you really want to get to the end of that road yeah yeah that's it you know especially like when we're talking about relationships and mm -hmm. you know a lot of people think it's all hocus pocus you know oh you're on that buddha stuff or yoga stuff or whatever and you know a lot of people i think when they think you do mindfulness or meditation that you should always be zen mm -hmm. like you should never be angry you should never be upset you should never be this and what this has taught me because I, I used to think that way as well you know Oh, look that person does yoga look she's upset or she does this why or he does that yeah. why why are they that way when this is what i've to me all the time i thought you taught mindfulness yeah <laughs> you know it, it's like no but, but I'm still, <laughs> yeah. what, do you know what's really good is me doing it with yugi because obviously when i've seen your setup your connections this that and the third and so to to see him do normal things you know to fidget a little bit when he's he's meditating and stuff like that just small little details and i'm like okay what, what you know, my uh, it's changing my my whole view on it, and actually doing these extra things that he's given me, and feeling it work, mm -hmm. like not just seeing it work, but feeling it work and understanding. I've been in this state before, and it's all normally when you know you're in a happy place, everything's going well for you, and then all of a sudden your energy is different, and you know you could just say hi to a girl and she gives you a number or you know you could just go out and all of a sudden some guy's giving you something for free like a deal or something mm -hmm. like that you're thinking that energy's going and that one thing disrupts it and then all of a sudden it all starts to fade yeah. but with what I've learned from Guy is how to hold on to that you know and is it a case of is it because the energy I'm putting out all these good things are happening or is it because I'm dealing with the bad things differently than I used to so those bad things are still happening, but I don't class them as bad things nah, anymore. I just class them as, you know, part of life. And so now I'm really acknowledging the good things and they're standing out more because the bad things, it's not like bad things are gone. I just don't label them as bad things. I, le I label them as things that kind of have to happen mm -hmm. that I should appreciate because it's going to help me appreciate the good things even more. So maybe the good things are just normal things now. Like on the podcast, I was listening to a couple of your podcasts today and, um, I remember the guest, but you know there is neither good nor bad. Yeah. But thinking makes it so, and it totally was Sh true, Shakespeare yeah. and yeah, Hamlet. Yeah. Yeah. Kath Granger, that one. Good yeah. Episode. yeah, yeah, good episode. Yeah. But yeah, you, so just pick up on one one thing you said about like um, thinking that you shouldn't have these waves of emotion. Like some people think that. Like again, I think it's in that book. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Goldman talks about the um, Dalai Lama who can go from crying. Mm -hmm almost violently yeah. but, you know over empathy for people who are suffering whatever into laughing like a madman in the next oh, minute yeah. and it's just you know the, the emotions come and go like yeah, just yeah. Uh, just and you, it's not hanging on to them that you know i think that that's uh that's the key thing and you talked as well about not okay you choosing not to go down that road yeah and what i found almost <coughs> frustrating but also good at the same time was yeah. i mentioned having a barney with my girlfriend right? um <laughs> sounds like a regular, <laughs> regular, regular occurrence <laughs> <laughs> it may have been <laughs> um but so i i was like i could be quite reactive yeah um and you know the, the okay what are the signs of anger okay like heat and, ang and like an, an energy coming up here you yeah. know 
and it's and that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's an it's an energy that like you talked about. Um, yeah. And but the thing that mindfulness gave me is when that happens, is to be aware of it and yeah. and and just to be able to observe it. And then the, you talked about a choice. It's like actually, mm-hmm. yeah. I felt like I got a responsibility mm-hmm. because I'm now aware of it to not follow it on. Yeah. It's a bit annoying. Well, you can be, be, I've got no excuse. You do that to zombie just go state. You can be in that zombie state, or you can. Oh, now I've got that space yeah. A or B. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that that's latest it, um, exactly Black it. Mirror. You know, yeah, you've got yeah. that choice every moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. But like I said, I love the idea that your podcast has now taken a direction where it's like, well, what's the big questions? What's important in life? And so, from you, for your own education, for your own experiences, in the action for happiness style, you know, what matters most for you? Um, a couple of things. So. Uh, I would say try, trying to just be better. Okay, three things I'll give you, okay? First of all, trying to be better all the time. Mm-hmm. Accept, accepting where you are and accepting how you are, Yeah. but looking to be better. I think that accepting part's really important as well because, you know, we're all messed up in our own ways and, you know, we can all try and reject those messed up parts and push them away. <clears throat> but actually... <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> but actually... Um, Trying to accept them and bring them on board, even the bits you really don't like. That's, I think, the first part. But then also, that's, and then that smooths a road to being a bit better. Yeah. So, that, so that's one thing. Another thing is, is trying to let go of patterns that get passed down from generation to generation. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, we all, particularly as you get older, you see things in your family in particular that are just old patterns being played out and played out yeah. and, and they get passed down. And, and often you can resent the things, the patterns, but without a huge amount of mindfulness, absolutely, you just pick them up and carry them on and pass them on. And, yeah. and one of the podcasts I did uh, was a, the guy called James Kerr who studied the All Blacks rugby team and, and they've got various mantras. And one of them is that you, you know, you're past this sort of um, uh, like a, a cloth, if you like, mm-hmm. And it gets passed from one generation to generation, and just you you have it for that time, and yeah. it's your it's up to you to look after it, mm. pass it on, ideally in a better state. Mm-hmm. And and I like that really nice analogy. Like you're never gonna be, no one's gonna be perfect, but if you can take those patterns mm-hmm. and improve them a bit, and then pass them on better, then yeah. you then you've done yeah. your role. It's a, it's a nice it's a nice visual, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, yeah. It's, it's a cloth. Yeah. So when you see a cloth, you want to keep it in a good state. So how are you gonna do that? You're gonna treat well. You're gonna keep it clean as opposed to passing down the family dance or something. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to do this dance. I don't you, like dance. You've got to look I, after I can't, cloth. Yeah, I can't dance as good as dad, so I'm not going to I'm yeah. not gonna do it. You know, you get passed down a cloth. Yeah. It's a physical thing that, yeah, you can Yeah, that heirloom, yeah. But yeah. I th- I just as a thing, I don't actually think it was a cloth, but it's a, like, it's yeah, a yeah, physical yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then the other thing is, is, well, it's just like the difference between happiness and meaning. Mm. So happiness, particularly when you were young, person i think is often based around um hedonism <laughs> and, and approval and stuff like that and i think going more towards the meaning part of and i think you know relationships and family and um you know trying to reduce the ego and be more out altruistic whether that's just in your family or broader however way you can do it yeah the more meaning you get i think the, the better you, you feel and the better you are yep. so i think you know channeling away from the ego and towards meaning is is the third one so those are my three oh, lovely so how can our listeners and our viewers get the um the latest podcast episodes and um you know get in touch monday wisdom um it's not uh so <laughs> uh well i mentioned it was, let's just focus on the podcast so it's called don't tell me the score so it's done by BBC Radio 4. Um, so you can get it on every all the main podcast platforms. Um, so, you know, iTunes, BBC Sounds, whatever one you want to do, whatever works for you. Um, and it comes out every Thursday and is going to keep going, hopefully, for a long time. And like I said, it, it's it, there are nuggets you can take away from every single one, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's definitely got value. It's way... Uh, wouldn't... I would encourage people not to be put off by the fact that there's a sport element because the sport, like I said, is incidental. Yeah, It's just a way into the story. It's just a way of exploring some of the things that every single episode has things that are relevant to absolutely anyone. And I think that people can definitely like 
benefit from them. And I've definitely, I've had a lot of nice texts and tweets, of people actually saying, you know, that they've yeah. put stuff into practice in their own lives and, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's helped them. So, which is a great feeling. And the, um, the latest, the, the rabbi, because um, in the Jewish community, because of their, you know, the days in which they must uh, respect their religion and they're not allowed to anything electronic. So don't tell me the score. Yeah, don't tell me the score. It's who like, knew? Huh? Yeah, who knew? But, but <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, that's such a weird reason for them to get in touch yeah. because living in that community, you know, all the, the, the weekend matches would go by and they don't know the score and they want to go watch match of the day later, later on at night. So they're like, don't tell me the score. So they, so your, your title resonated very well. Yeah, wow. yeah. So yeah, that, that was an interesting one. So yeah, they got in touch for that that reason. I thought, and I wanted to just show that it's it's not just sport. You know, I want to be as broad as I possibly can. The big question, like you said. Absolutely. Amen to that. I tell you, he was full of some interesting stuff. South, Af- South Africa. A South bit of South yeah, Africa, mate. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, we get a right old mix on there. I mean, yeah. crikey, who are, Mm-hmm. Chief Rabbi, you know, that's yeah. broad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish you all the best. And again, thank you very much, man. Thanks you know, you me. introduced me to that to that BBC quality pod, podcast <laughs> life. And, you know, I'm forever f- grateful for both of you for that. Yeah, so, um, pleasure. So, yeah, Mazel Tov. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> and remember, if you'd like to help create a happier world, please get involved with Action for Happiness. You can join thousands of others who are spreading a bit more happiness in their homes, workplaces, schools and local communities. Our website has all the information you need to sign up for our Exploring What Matters course and also details about facilitating one yourself. All the information is online and we're here to answer any questions you have. Don't forget to subscribe, like and follow to keep up to date with all our content. Find out more at actionforhappiness.org. Join the movement, be the change.